Hello, Fanshawe, and welcome to EDI Talks. EDI Talks is a series of informal discussions aimed at raising awareness about equity-deserving topics in the safe open space. Today, we're coming from the Galloway Circle in the Library Learning Commons, and Galloway is an Oneida word meaning good message, and we hope to bring you some good messages as part of our ongoing commitment toward removing systemic barriers. EDI Talks will feature a different topic each month and is hosted by myself, Troy Townsend. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the anti-racism and inclusion specialist at the college. This month, December 3rd is recognized as the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And it's kind of a treat for me today to introduce our guest. It's Joseph Pisano, the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Fanshawe. He happens to also be my boss and um, someone I admire a lot. Has a, I have a lot of respect for him and welcome Joseph. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. We're going to have a very informal discussion about abilities, disabilities, ableism. But first, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role here at Fanshawe? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Joseph Pizzano. My pronouns are he and they. And uh, as you mentioned, Troy, I'm the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. So we really work to advance a sense of belonging for folks, particularly equity deserving folks on our campuses. And so uh, folks should feel free to reach out to us anytime. But we'll do we'll do the plug of our email address yeah. a couple of times. Uh, EDI at fanshawe.ca if folks want to connect with us. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So as I've just mentioned, the United Nations has a formally recognized December 3rd as the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. I'm going to get right into it, Joseph, and ask you to tell us a little bit about your experiences working with people with disabilities. Sure. So I've had lots of experience with disability over the years in my personal and my professional life. And um, when I went to grad school, my research focused a lot on disability, primarily in historical legal cases involving disability and accommodation. And it's interesting because I think in some ways, although we've moved beyond some of those tropes and myths about disability, um, some of those myths that those courts relied upon historically are the same kinds of myths that we rely on today about disability. So when I went to law school, I, I continued to work in disability law. And one of my most formative experiences, not just as a lawyer, but in my life, was working at the Workers' Rights Disability Law Clinic. And that organization provided free legal advice to folks with disabilities who couldn't afford legal representation, who had um, experienced some kind of hardship or adverse treatment related to disability, including failure to accommodate or discrimination. And I would sit for hours and just listen to their stories. And I learned a few things. One, I learned that I think disability is one of the most insidious forms of discrimination in workplaces because it's sometimes so invisible to mm -hmm. others around us, because I think we've gotten so good at internalizing some of those negative attitudes about disability that we don't even recognize that they're happening and impacting folks. Um, and I think we're, we're also really good at um, hiding discrimination in a sense, because even when we're experiencing discrimination, sometimes it takes us a minute to figure out what's going on and that we deserve better, not just on disability discrimination, but a wide range of kind of identity grounds. Um, but at that clinic, clients would come to us after having experienced discrimination for years and sometimes, in many cases, actually decades. And I'm, I'm still heartbroken by a lot of the stories that I, I heard there. I remember them often, actually. And I think feeling like you don't belong at your job mm -hmm. um, because people can't see past your disability um, is awful. Um, but I drew so much strength from those folks because their resilience in the face of so much of that oppression um, really wanted, really inspired me to do more. And part of the reason I got into this equity work too. Right. Um, but I also learned that uh, there is really no company, and this was a really big lesson for me, um, there's no company or organization, no matter how big or how small, that is immune to disability discrimination. I saw the, you know, the smallest startups to the biggest and most recognized um, companies right. in, in California. And there's no company or organization, no matter how outwardly committed they are to diversity and inclusion, that doesn't have the potential to turn their back on folks with disabilities. Um, and uh, disability is also one of those things that's sometimes really hard for otherwise progressive and empathetic and anti-oppressive folks who 
are really good allies in other aspects of their lives to get their heads around. And one of the best stories I have about that is when I started doing equity work, um, I started doing workshops for folks, particularly around hiring. And one of the things I talked to folks about was how leaves, medical leaves, stress leaves, okay. et cetera, um, get held against folks in the hiring process if they see a gap in a resume, for example. And so um, I started to pose the question to folks in those workshops. Um, let's say you have two candidates, one who's the, the most qualified person in the world. Maybe they even have a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. and, but you, they disclose to you that they have a number of mental health identifications and that every few years they need to take leaves in order to take um, care of themselves. So that's candidate A. Or you have candidate B who's you know, kind of an average candidate, they're fine, but um, they don't have any disabilities, they've disclosed that. Um, and so what do you do? And the answer that I was expecting from folks was to start a conversation about how disability doesn't compromise excellence. Of course, we would go for the Nobel Prize winning candidate. Mm -hmm. And almost in every case, in every workshop I did, I would get the response back, well, I don't think we could ever manage the person who gets multiple leaves. So I think we'd have to go with the other candidate. Um, and it was really kind of eye-opening for me because um, it's, it, it, it's interesting that folks who are really deeply committed to equity or say they're deeply committed to equity um, still have kind of these negative assumptions about um, so folks with disabilities. And it's also really interesting because you create like the perfect fictional candidate, right? Like the candidate with the Nobel Prize and yes. you still get the response back about the disability being the thing that makes that candidate weak or even unhirable in, in, some, in some people's viewpoint. Absolutely. No company is immune to this. Like this is an area that's overlooked. And I know you and I have had discussions about visible barriers and invisible barriers and what people are facing. Okay, so we've already started talking about disabilities, but maybe we can step back and put a little definition of disability on the table. Would you be able to do that? Yeah, sure. So um, let me first start out by saying that for as many people as there are with disabilities, there are as many definitions or experiences or uh, perceptions of what disability is. So to a large extent, I think it's up to each person to determine how much that label applies to them or whether that label applies to them, even with you know, two folks with the exact same condition or identification. Some folks might use the label of disability and other folks might not use that label. Um, so one example, there's lots of folks in the disability community who would use person first language, so person with a disability. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also lots of folks uh, who wouldn't use person first language um, and, and actually would want to own that label of disability and say, I'm a disabled person, this is my, my disability. So um, some folks speak in terms of diversity of abilities instead, like neurodiversity is I think is one of those terms that speaks to diversity of ability. Um, and then there are some terms that have been reclaimed by folks with, with disabilities too, that if an able-bodied person or an able-minded person said that particular term, it would be considered derogatory. Mm -hmm. But for folks in the disability community, some have um, reclaimed those terms. So to me, disability means a lot of things. It's physical disabilities, um, mental or intellectual identifications, learning disabilities. Again, some folks that we would put traditionally under that label of learning disability might not hold that label themselves. Um, but it's physical, sensory, um, psychiatric, cognitive, chronic, present and past conditions. Um, again, it's that personal component of whether you feel like you identify with that label. Um, and disability could be temporary. So if uh, some folks uh, might have been following the, the Senate race in, in Pennsylvania recently where the candidate um, John Fetterman recently had a stroke. And so he was using some um, accommodation technology during his interviews to process mm -hmm. um, what folks were saying because he was still regaining that ability to kind of understand what folks were saying. Um, and it was really interesting to see how that was covered, but that's a, an example of a temporary, or at least we think temporary um, disability and a temporary accommodation. Um, and that might not be temporary for, for someone else, right? And then the last thing I would say is that um, we should also talk about disability in terms of a social model of disability. So the medical model of disability would look at someone's quote unquote impairment or condition and look at that as the lens through which we should look at disability. 
And the social model of disability says, well, how is society disabling folks? So the example I use with my students is to talk about um, uh, someone who uses a wheelchair, comes up to a building, it doesn't have a ramp. Well, the medical model of disability would say it's the person's quote unquote physical impairment that's prohibiting them from getting, preventing them from getting into the building. The social model of disability would say, well, it's the, the societal choice not to have the ramp at that particular building. So the social model is really important. And then I said the last thing, but I have one more thing. That's um, okay. Uh, so it's also important for us to think about disability from an intersectional lens. So thinking about disability uh, intersecting with race or gender studies or sexuality. Um, one example, women of color have combated hypersexualization, but we often desexualize folks with disabilities and think that they have no um, sexual interest. But both of those categories of identity, so um, folks of color and also um, folks with disabilities, are targeted more by sexual violence. So we would think about why we have different mythologies about intersections of sexuality with race and disability, but we still get some of those same outcomes. So that's a long answer to your question. No, about that's what disability a is. great answer. And that last part that you mentioned is very interesting. I didn't think of that. I didn't know that. So um, some of the other things that you spoke to, I do agree with. As you know, I have a history here at the college working with students with disabilities. I've been supporting students with disabilities um, as an academic advisor in my role in the Chess Center since about 20, 2005, I would say. So it's a lot of my work and I've seen some of the cases that you've spoken about, I've seen it all. And there's temporary, there's visible, there's <laughs> invisible barriers. And one particular point that you made, I totally agree with. A lot of times there's students that have learned to live with their disabilities and cope, and they're quite competent and very confident with how they manage and navigate their life and through the buildings, but the barriers they face are with the infrastructure, not, not their own barriers. It's not because of their disability. It's because of the way they're treated or um, systemic barriers or, like I said, facilities. So I have seen that happen and that's what we have to get over and that's what we have to work towards is removing some of those systemic barriers that are preventing people from living their full authentic lives. Yeah. Totally agree. 100%. And, and Troy's being humble. Troy has done phenomenal work in the community around disability too. So you're, you're a tremendous uh, disability advocate. Thank you. Now, this leads us right into the next question. This yeah. is perfect. So can you explain for us the concept of ableism? Yeah, so I'm trying to talk more about systems of oppression to get folks to understand what we're talking about when we say systems of oppression. Um, and ableism is a system of oppression, just like racism, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, toxic masculinity, all of those things are, are systems of oppression. And they operate to oppress folks based on their identity. So I have a great definition from Talia Lewis, and TL says, um, ableism is a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally, con societally constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, excellence, and productivity. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in anti-blackness, eugenics, colonialism, and capitalism. This form of systemic oppression leads to people and society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's experience and or their ability to satisfactorily produce, excel, and behave. So I love that definition from TL. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some examples? Uh, there's so many <laughs> examples <laughs> of people. Um, so either minimizing disability, like just get over it, that's ableism, but so is hyper-focusing on disability. So, oh my goodness, that must be such a struggle yeah. for you. Um, yeah. Thinking a student who's accommodated is less academically inclined, thinking that a student with a disability can't go on to higher education, um, not thinking proactively about disability and making decisions with disability in mind. So thinking like, oh, we can make adjustments later for the student or the employee with disability instead of thinking, how might this decision impact um, students or employees with disability? Good points. Joseph, can you tell me, do you have someone from disability history who inspires you? <laughs> 
I do try. <laughs> um, so I should start by saying that anyone working against a system that has been oppressing them inspires me. Um, genuinely, I don't just say that, but um, we've not designed a world for disability. And so um, folks with disabilities often have to shape shift to fit into these systems. So anyone that says, that's not good enough for me, who fights against those barriers, um, I can't tell you how much that means to me. But yes, there's, there's one person who I think about a lot. Um, our uh, EDI Talks audience may be familiar with them. Um, and these are facts relayed to us by Joan Leon, who's the co-founder of the World Institute on Disability. Um, but the person is Ed Roberts. So Ed Roberts was a leading um, activist, disability activist in the United States. And he used a wheelchair and required an iron lung to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, he went uh, to high school mostly by telephone. So I say that Ed Roberts was doing e-learning before it was cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, he didn't complete physical education or driver's ed as mm -hmm. part of his high school. And so uh, they initially weren't going to give him his high school diploma. And then his mother advocated on his behalf. And they eventually let him get his diploma. Um, so he goes on to community college and then uh, applies to the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and they don't initially know about his disability, and so they accept him. But then they find out about his disability when he arrives, um, and they want to refuse to admit him mm -hmm. because they, uh, the, the reason they give is that his iron lung is not going to fit into the dorm room. So as is the story with Ed Roberts, he persists. Um, he challenges them again, and he wins. Um, but he's the classic example of someone who won't give up against that system when it's pushing him down. And uh, he's the first student at Berkeley to use a wheelchair. Uh, he develops the Physically Disabled Students Program, which provides uh, disabled students with wheelchair repair, attendant referral, peer counseling, um, advocates for things like curb cuts, not just at the university, but at the city of Berkeley too. Um, and he finds the first Center for Independent Living, which um, as you know, it has become a really important model for, for disability justice. Um, so he graduates with his bachelor's degree, then his master's degree, and a few years after his graduation, he's appointed the director of the California Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. And it's super interesting because that's the same agency that just a few years before that would have deemed him um, too disabled, quote unquote, to hold a job mm -hmm. with their agency. So. His legacy is the role um, he played in creating those independent living centers throughout the state of California. So I think about Ed a lot because um, I, I, I've talked about him so much in my legal courses, in the courses I've taught in my equity roles, but I've seen so much of Ed in those students and those staff mm -hmm. members too. Mm -hmm. um, they too meet systems that aren't built for them and push up against them. Um, and so my lesson from his story is that it really truly is inspiring. But the lesson, too, is that it shouldn't have to be that hard. Right. He shouldn't have to push, shouldn't have had to push that hard. And folks like Ed today are still fighting in many of the same ways that he is. He fought in different ways for different things. Um, and they shouldn't have to fight that hard like Ed fought. So that's, that's my right. lesson from him. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Did you meet him? Did you know him when no, you were no, there? No, no, no. He was, um, he was way, be he was in the, that was the 60s and 70s. Okay. Yeah. So it's people like that with their tenacity and persistence who are the pioneers yeah. for others. And I think of Stephen Hawking, too, is a prime example when you talk about a Nobel Prize winner, but not being hired by the company for the role. But he, that's, the, I mean, that's an extreme example. But those are the people that have pioneered the way for others to come after them. And we have some resources, which I'll speak to in a few minutes here at the college for folks that may need some services. Yeah. They did name a center after Ed Roberts oh, at Berkeley, and that's where they held the clinic. Okay. So that has some nice connections. Exactly. To yeah. Exactly. Good. Thank you for sharing his story sure. with us. So the official UNESCO website states that 2022 International Disability International Day for People with Disabilities theme is transformative solutions for inclusive development, the role of innovation in fueling an accessible and equitable world. That's quite a lengthy theme, but I'm wondering if you can break it down for us and perhaps share your thoughts how Fanshawe can approach future innovations. And we're building Innovation Village over here. So how can we look at our campus facilities and resources with a more inclusive lens towards AODA compatibility and compliance? Sure. 
So I'll talk about a book first. So there's a fantastic book by uh, Jay Dolmage. It's called Academic Ableism, Disability in Higher Education. And in it, he summarizes a bunch of research about the barriers that students with disabilities in Canada are facing. And he finds a few really interesting things. So one, um, disabled students have up to 60% more debt by the time they graduate than able-bodied or able-minded students. Um, graduation rates, retention rates are quite a bit lower for students with disabilities. Um, he also talks about the limit of accommodation. So accommodation is essential, but there's also limits to it. So he notes that one in seven Canadians have a disability, but only 2% of Canadian students actually seek accommodations. And he cites a study indicating that, amazingly, 8% of Canadian colleges and universities have in some years reported having zero students with disabilities at their campuses. Um, so he reasons that there are about 100,000 to 200,000 students each year in Canada who need accommodations but don't seek them. So if we think about how we have about 2.1 million post-secondary students across Canada, that's a big number to have 100,000 to 200,000 of those students unaccommodated. Mm -hmm. um, he cites one of the barriers to seeking accommodations are peer attitudes and faculty attitudes that a common narrative is that accommodation is a leg up or an unfair advantage. Um, and students have certainly heard that, I think. So that's a long intro to your question. What can we do to approach disability justice on our campuses? So I have five tips for you. Okay. Um, so one, uh, we can listen to folks with disabilities and hear their stories. I think this really goes back to the Ed Roberts story. Um, Ed Roberts appealed and appealed and appealed until someone would listen. And we shouldn't have to make people raise those concerns so many times in order to, to hear them. Um, Empathy is really key. Uh, one of the examples I use in my workshops is the example of the late employee. So what does a disability justice lens say about a late employee? Well, there's lots of disability reasons why someone might be late, right? Mm -hmm. Disability flares in the morning. Maybe their transit was delayed. They need accessible transit. Um, maybe someone with OCD or anxiety was caught up with something before they came to work. Um, so what I tend to do is when I find something frustrating, I ask the equity question first, like, is there an equity answer for why this might be happening? And regardless of whether there is an equity issue or a disability issue at play, I don't think you're ever gonna go wrong by starting from that place of empathy, like thinking about just putting myself in that person's shoes and thinking about them for a second. Um, and when you do know that a student or an employee needs support from a disability lens, um, we should really think about how we can support that student and get to a yes on that support. Um, you mentioned the AODA. So uh, number three, I think compliance is really important, but just disability justice is so much more than that. So the AODA was a really important piece of legislation, but I kind of think we have two choices about the AODA. We can comply to the letter of the AODA or we can comply to the spirit of it. And I think the spirit of it is, is much broader. So striving to think about how we can integrate disability justice into everything we do, I think is so much more impactful. Um, number four, I think that um, disability is the forgotten part of equity work. We've talked about this yes. before too. Um, some folks who do equity work haven't focused enough on disability. And sometimes there's an attitude of, well, I just haven't heard very much about disability issues. So we'll get to that when we have the time and the resources. Um, but folks with disabilities have been waiting a long time. And sometimes that silence of not hearing about those issues as much is exhaustion with trying to get those issues heard and not having a response to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I also think we don't think about ableism in the same way we think about other systems of oppression. So sometimes equity folks are like, oh, we have the person in that other department that makes documents accessible, or oh, if you need support with mental health, go to counseling services. Yeah. But um, we have to think about ableism in the same way we think about homophobia or transphobia or sexism or classism or racism. If we don't root it out of all the things we do on a daily basis, we won't get rid of it. So it's not the it's not the cousin that doesn't fit with the other equity issues. Sometimes it's treated like that. It really is, should sit right alongside of other equity issues. And then the last thing, uh, I'll close on that innovation part of the theme you mentioned. So I think innovative solutions for folks with disabilities are often innovative solutions for everyone. 
Um, one of the best examples I think of this is hybrid or remote work. So I worked with so many folks before COVID who uh, could so have used that as an accommodation, either to as a caregiver yep. or to manage a disability, just having a day or two at home in that more comfortable environment, sometimes for folks with disabilities is really helpful. Um, and so many times the response back would be that that accommodation wasn't possible, it wasn't reasonable, we could never achieve it. Yes. And then all of a sudden overnight, all yeah. of us were thrown into <laughs> hybrid or remote work, right? So. So, and, and now we're having that conversation about what the benefits of hybrid work look like for folks. And so I think innovating to accommodate folks with disabilities is also innovation for everyone in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. You touched on a couple of really great points. And I know, like you said, you and I have had these discussions before relating to diversity is so much more about race or gender or sexual orientation, but it's there's invisible barriers there as well. So people, you never know. You never know what somebody's going through. You never know how someone is starting their day. I like those points. I was also thinking about um, in relation to international students and our international population here on campus is growing. And in some cultures, admitting that you have a disability or speaking up or seeking help or seeking that assistance or service that you may need is frowned upon because it makes you look like you are less than, back to the ableism. And if you don't meet the criteria for what the perfect person is, then you are less than. And some cultures do not accept that. So students coming from those cultures are less inclined to seek the assistance and help that they need. And I'm sure you and I will have further discussions about how we can reach out to that segment of our demographic here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we know that that stigma gets perpetuated in peer groups too, right? So if, that's, if yes. that's an internalized idea that you have and then that gets reinforced by folks around you, regardless of whether they share your, your cultural upbringing or not, then yeah, that, that is a barrier to seeking accommodation, right? That yeah. knowing that that is something that you can access and being willing to access mm -hmm. that is a really important um, step. Yeah. For sure, for sure. So almost finished here, Joseph. Thank you, you've given us so much to think about. Um, but do you have a final takeaway for those living with a disability or someone who may be supporting or be a caregiver for a loved one with a disability? Yeah, so I have some resources. Um, I put a, together a little resource list. So, um, so I mentioned Jay Delmage's book, Academic Ableism. Um, fantastic book, everyone should read it if they're in higher ed. Um, I also recommend literally anything from Dr. Sammy Schock, um, spelt uh, S-C-H-A-L-K. Um, follow her on Twitter, she's amazing. Um, read her books. Um, her second book is called Black Disability Politics, and it looks at how black cultural workers have engaged disability as a political issue differently than the white dominated disability rights movement. So it gets at that intersectional question that we were talking about. Um, but any of her work is fantastic. Uh, and then there's a great podcast, so it's called The Disability Visibility Project, hosted by Alice Wong. Um, she does lots of different interviews about disability identity, particularly, again, at the intersections of disability and race and gender and sexual identity. So um, those are, are fantastic starting points for folks that want to learn more. Great. Thank you for those resources. We'll yeah. put them up on the screen for folks. Perfect. Um, and that wraps up our conversation today. Like I said, you've given us a lot to think about um, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy your schedule is. So thank you for chatting with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to come back anytime to your, what, okay. we're, what we're calling edits, yeah. EDI Talks. Our EDI Talks. So I would once again like to thank Joseph very much for being the guest today. And if any viewers have thoughts or any information or questions that you'd like to share, um, please reach out to us. Our email is edi at and it's on the screen. I just want to mention some resources that we have on campus. We have um, an accessibility services area that you can access, students can access through Counseling Student Life. We do have um, an accessibility lab for students that has accommodated software on it. We also have a testing center that students can seek extra time or extra accommodations. There's hardware and software in there. There's voice to text readers. Um, so you have to go through the Counseling and Student Life Office to 
have an appointment and get assessed for your needs. Um, I'm trying to remember the phone number, I believe is 519-452 and it was 4282, but I think they've added a 14282 is the new number now. So um, that's it for today. Join us for January's EDI Talks when we will discuss Chinese New Year. And on behalf of Joseph and myself, take care of yourselves and each other.